long story short, I ended up trading a $75,000 account all the way down to 10. And comparing myself to what I had heard my dad did. He did triple digit returns in the US investing championship in his 20s. It actually doesn't bother me um, if I take 10 losses in a row. I just make sure that they are minuscule. My limit is 1% for the account on every trade. That's like the most I'm willing to lose. In October of 22, and if you had seen this, then you could have started stock picking three or four months earlier than anyone else. My position size is dependent on the chart. I let the chart and, and the stock determine how much risk I'm gonna take. You don't necessarily need to get the IT stock in order to have good performance right. in a year. 577 trades in a year. I'm only right 27% of the time and I finished the year up 150%. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trailline Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. Uh, this is brought to you by the free Ultimate Trading Guide. You can pick up your copy uh, down below. Uh, joining us today is someone who I've wanted to talk to for quite some time. Uh, I've been really looking forward to this. We've got Sean Ryan, uh, top performer in the US Investing Championship. Um, for really, you know, the past few years, uh, love that he's been so consistent and really looking forward to diving into his process, uh, top setups and how he handled last year as well. He's had multiple triple digit years, uh, two in a row uh, the past two years. Uh, so, Sean, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, like I said, really looking forward to this. Richard, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. And um, like I always like to start with, I'd love to hear about your background, how you first got into trading. Uh, obviously, many of the people watching know your dad, David Ryan, uh, market wizard. Uh, so we'd love to hear how kind of he influenced you if he did, or if you kind of rebelled a little bit, went your own way. Uh, but yeah, start me off, you know, how did you first get interested in the markets? And um, yeah, what, what's been kind of your journey like? Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely been a long journey. And um, yeah, I am assuming most people watching this uh, interview will, will be familiar with who my dad is, um, his relationship with William O'Neill and, um, you know, winning the U S investing championships three years in a row. Um, but despite all that, um, there was, there was no sort of pressure growing up to trade stocks from him. Um, my dad's always had this perspective that you should do what you love. Um, and if you do that, you'll never work a day in your life. And so he, he never wanted to, you know, force any career path on me and my brother. Um, and so, uh, just growing up, we, you know, we were focused on school mostly and just, you know, living, uh, enjoying childhood. Um, I, I didn't actually, uh, start thinking about the market until late high school. Um, this was like, you know, when I was 17 or 18, uh, I started to realize how successful my dad actually was. And, um, at that point, I, I, you know, sort of asked him, like, if he could, you know, give me some investment advice or, or just sort of, you know, take me under his wing a little bit and give me the secrets. Yeah. 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 The secret sauce. Um, but, uh, but it's, it, it, so he, at that point, he really just sort of redirected me to a lot of the, the can slim William O'Neill stuff. I, I, re I read, um, how to make uh, money in stocks by William O'Neill. And um, he had me, you know, annotate the book and ask him questions to clarify certain things that I read. Um, and then we went through some chart examples, cup and handles, head and shoulders, just like what a good base looks like, what to look like in, in regards to volume. But it was really, really general. Um, it wasn't anything, it, it wasn't anything you could have, uh, you know, just gotten from the, from the book, essentially. Um, right. but, but that's sort of how I started, uh, opened up a Roth IRA when I was 18 and had a few thousand dollars in there and just sort of, uh, started trading basically in college. So I wasn't, it wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't like in middle school, you know, you know, studying charts, doing sit-ups and right. doing all this like training, you know, but, um, yeah, I was very casual and I just sort of. Uh, I started trading in, in college uh, pretty casually. Um, I would make a little money, I would lose a little money, never really made much progress. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so I just sort of did that for a couple of years. Ended up studying uh, business administration. So the last two years of college, I got a lot of finance and accounting classes, management classes. 
And around that time, sort of analyzing companies, um, I thought, you know, what better way to test my knowledge of what I've been learning in class than, you know, trading stocks and trying to find value there. And so uh, I really started to get more into trading. Um, I would I would send in uh, trades during class. Sometimes I would have my laptop up during a, a lecture and I'd be watching a chart. And so it, it, it got a lot more involved in my, um, my early 20s. So 20, 21, 22 was when I really started to get an interest in it. Um, and around that time, I was sort of uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do in regards to careers and stuff like that. And um, I, I initially, I, I actually had a lot of interest in um, I wanted to travel and I wanted to do something kind of exciting and so I really wanted to um, uh, I really wanted to work for like a like a non-profit uh, humanitarian like type organization uh, mm -hmm. either that or um, or join uh, join the military actually so I kind of wanted to do sort of these things that involved you know your excitement or whatever um, but Something my dad had already had always told me growing up is that it doesn't really matter what career path you have, you can always supplement your income with gains that you make um, investing, and that's the coolest thing about it. You could be, you could have whatever career you you want um, or whatever you're passionate about, and you, you don't have to worry about you know not making money if you're doing well in the stock market or if you're you're being you know wise with your investment decisions. And so, tw twenty two. I, um, instead of going straight into uh, a career path, I approached my dad and I, I asked him if he could uh, uh, me <clears throat> mentor me in a, in a formal way, you know, to mm -hmm. really do like, like a for formal mentorship. And he, um, he, he said yes, and I, I think he was pretty excited to, to share everything he had sort of uh, learned over the years, um, and so that's that's sort of how that's sort of how I started uh, trading, and then those next two years were very pivotal uh, pivotal in just sort of the way um, my mind has shaped how I see the market, price action, um, psychology, and all that stuff. <clears throat> but those two years were actually um, a pretty uh, a, a pretty uh, difficult. Uh, two years um, for, for myself and my dad because um, it was just uh, yeah it was choppy yeah it was really um, so I mean I'll just sort of I'll, I'll explain it this way it started off pretty it started off really great um, I was living at home and my dad gave me tons of books to read I read you know a book a week or something on the market and my dad has got like you know these these towers of chart books that he he studies, and so I would look through you know thousands of charts, just sort of studying what a good set, setup looks like. Um, and at the same time, I, I had um, a small account that I was able to trade and experiment with, um, and and that's sort of the best way you learn is is uh, is is learning from your uh, experience and, and your mistakes and sort of back testing your results and all that stuff. Um, right. And just sort of, I mean, you can, you can have this like intellectual knowledge about how the market works, but you don't really, um, it doesn't really uh, make a difference to you until you, you feel the emotions when your money's at stake and it's, right. you know, it's going up in value or, it's, or you're losing money. Um, but so anyways, the, the first year, that I was, uh, I was sort of doing this uh, mentorship with my dad. It it was it was a good year. It, I I made um, twenty five percent in my account, which, you know, compared to the last you know f four years in college, that was great. You know, I had never really made much much progress um, while I was studying in school. But um, but yeah, so so twenty five percent is. A decent performance for your first full-time year trading um, but that was it, it was to me it was somewhat of a disappointment because you know I'm, I'm just sort of com I'm comparing myself to what I had heard my dad did right like right um, 
you know, he did triple digit returns in the U.S. investing championship in his 20s. Um, you know, 25% means nothing uh, com in comparison. And I don't know, I don't know if you remember or I don't know how long you've been watching the market, but 2016-2017 um, was also the first really big uh, publicized Bitcoin move. And I remember seeing that on um, on the news, how this thing that didn't have any like earnings or fundamentals, it went from like twelve hundred dollars to nineteen thousand. And yeah. I'm sitting there, you know, with a twenty five percent gain after twelve months of like studying the market with the master. And um, I just uh, at at that point, I really just. I, I wanted to figure out how to double my account and it didn't seem like I was going to do that with sort of like, you know, classic canned slim stuff. At least that's what I was thinking in my head. Mm -hmm. And so the second year I started experimenting, I sort of, uh, I started day trading. I started, um, uh, throughout fundamentals completely. I just started looking at the charts and, uh, was, I was really into just like finding a big momentum play and just like throwing like a, a big portion of my account into those things. And oftentimes I was um, leveraging my account. So I was using like 150% or 200% of my account value. And I was throwing like, you know, 50% or more into like some speculative biotech or even yep. like a triple leveraged gold miner. Um, and over the months, I I would have like some big gains. Like, I mean, there were times I would make, you know, 30% in my account in a week, you know, something crazy like that. But then, you know, the next week I would lose like 20 or 30% back. And my, my account was just as volatile as the stocks that I was trading. And I, again, wasn't making any progress. I was just increasing volatility and, um, I mean, when that happens, you start to almost live with the stocks that you're trading and you start to like emulate the emotions that you feel in the stocks. And so I was getting extremely frustrated. Um, and my, you know, my dad could see that I was getting frustrated and that I wasn't really sort of following like the rules that he, he taught me. And eventually, I, I mean, what, when it comes down to it, I just wanted to make too much money in too short a time yeah. and um, it really um, almost turned into a, like a gambling addiction where I would um, like on the, on the, the market openings, I would look for like the biggest gaps up and there, there were stocks that were like up 50% on some news report and I would, you know, zoom into like a one minute chart and try to find an entry and throw like, 75% of my account in on this stock that's up 50% on the morning. And, um, you know, it was the same thing. I would make like 10% in my account, like in the morning and then the next day or in the afternoon, I would like give it all back and more. And long story short, I ended up trading a $75,000 account all the way down to 10. Um, and I mean, that's like an 80% drawdown or 85 or something. And, um, you don't even really think about this when you're, when you're, when you're gambling, but you can't recover from that. Um, it's not like, it's not like you lose 80%. All you need is an 80% gain to get, to get back to break even, um, at $10,000, I would have needed a six or 700 percent gain uh to make my money back and um and so yeah at that at that point it was pretty much uh game over for me um i was 24 and i had lost a big chunk of money and i um, at that point i was so angry and upset and prideful that i didn't want to ad like admit blame and so who, like who better to sort of take blame than the person who, uh, told me that I could, you know, make money in the markets. And so, um, I really, I kind of pushed blame on my dad. Um, and, 
it wasn't it wasn't right to do that but um yeah i he yeah at the time he was my mentor and um he uh he was my therapist. I, I would kind of like, you know, tell him how I was like thinking and yeah. how my psychology was in regards to my positions. Um, but eventually he ended up becoming my punching bag and my scapegoat. Like, I mean, I just, I, I didn't want to admit that I had um, done wrong in the market. And so I just sort of, um, I put blame on my dad. And the way we ended those two years was that um, dad, like, he, like, your methods don't work anymore. Like, like, whatever you were doing in the '80s and '90s, they're, they they don't they don't really um, they don't work. And um, and I you know I left I left after those two years like being more confused about the market than when I started. And so I I basically quit. And um, I, it would, I mean, it, it sounds very dramatic. It was, it was dramatic. I moved out I moved down, uh, from, from LA area down to Orange County, moved in with some, some friends. I got a job in, um, I got, a, I got a job doing sales, um, just sort of outbound, like on the, on the phone. Um, and, and I enlisted in the army reserves. So it was sort change. of like, yeah, it was sort of just like, I'm over this. Trading is like, you know, um, it's gambling. You know, you can't make money in the in the stock market unless you're lucky, basically. And so that that's how you know that's how I basically got started in the market was just this super traumatic um, uh, beginning. And I actually didn't look at a stock chart or index chart for the next 12 months. I was officially done with it. Um, and yeah, any, any, any questions like in regards to that? I mean, cause that, that's pretty much how I blew up. You know, I, I didn't really figure out really anything up until that point, but that's, that's just the history of it. Um, so any, anything, any questions for that? No, nothing big. It's just, it's just interesting to hear that perspective because, um, obviously, you know, everybody from the outside looking in, you've got a market wizard at your yeah. dad, it should be easy for you, but you're kind of, you kind of are you kind of went through the journey that pretty much everybody goes through where you, you start to love it, but then you find out it's a lot harder than you think and yeah. you have to work through those challenges. So I think a lot of people can emulate with your story for sure. Well, yeah, no, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that from the outside you would expect, Oh, like, you know, Sean, he's David's son. He must have some genetic code where he, you know, just knows how to trade or right. he's got the same, like, um, emotional makeup and all that stuff. Um, and you know, I learned from my dad for, you know, a year or a year and a half or whatever, and I have access to all of his knowledge and wisdom. But, um, I mean, two things, the market doesn't care who your dad is. It's just gonna, it's yeah. gonna move in the way it wants. It doesn't care, you know, um, about, about that. Um, but also you're, you could know, you know, what the right thing to do is, but that doesn't mean you have the discipline and the self-control to, to enact those, you know, that wisdom. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, the, the market, it, it's just going to kind of do what it does and you need to be able to, you know, control your emotions and all that stuff. So anyways, I, I obviously didn't do that. Um, uh, blew up my account, just sort of, uh, I didn't, I didn't wreck my relationship with my dad, but I, I, I certainly at that time damaged it and, um, yeah, moved down to, to Orange County, kind of fresh, uh, fresh start. Um, and I, I picked up this sales job, which was like the worst job in the world. Like, I mean, we were on East coast hours and I'm here on the West coast. Oof. And so I was, yeah. in, I was in the office making calls at six in the morning, um, mm. And yeah, it, and it was like, they paid you minimum wage. They expected you, they expected you to make money on commission. So I was getting paid like 25, 30,000 a year. And so it was like a dead end job for me. And, um, yeah, I was just sort of, I felt like stuck and trapped in that moment. I didn't really have like savings either at that point because I had lost all this money and I was sort of you know, too, too prideful to ask my dad for, you know, a handout. I, 
I, yeah, so, um, but, yeah, it was, it was around, like, n like, not, like, nine months into the job, uh, I'd come home for, like, Thanksgiving, or, n I, I don't know, it was, like, or e Easter, I think, or something like that, and my dad and my brother were talking about, uh, the, the U.S. investing championship that started up again, and, you know, the, it, it had already been going for, like, three months, and I was like, what, why didn't you guys tell me about that? You know, that, that's super, that's super interesting. Like the championship that you won, it started back up again. And, right. um, and my dad was like, yeah, I didn't think you were interested in that stuff anymore. <laughs> and I mean, he was right. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in trading anymore, but at the same time, I, the job I had sucked. And, um, so I, so anyways, I, I, I had heard about it and I, um, I, I didn't, um, I actually didn't even have enough money to enter at the time. But, um, when I heard about it, I started just sort of like looking at charts again. I started just sort of scanning through names and looking at the indexes. And because I had been away for so long, a lot of the, um, setups looked very just like fresh to me they just seemed like right. oh that actually looks pretty good you know um and uh i i started trading at my desk when i was you know supposed to be making calls throughout the day and um i i had actually been able in, in that spring the spring of 2019 i had not entered the u.s investing championship but i I, because I didn't have enough money, but I had $15,000 and I traded that up to, um, 22,000 over the course of a few months. And I had enough money to then enter, um, the USIC if I wanted to. And I, I decided like, um, Actually, the, the interesting thing about, about that spring was that I, I had actually made more money trading than I did at my sales job. So well, I, I was kind of like, I was kind of like, man, like, um, like, yeah, wh why am I not dedicating more time to this? Uh, I'm not, I'm not good at sales. I'm not like, this is not a job that I want even for the next, uh, you know, the next year, maybe I should start focusing on trading. And so, um, I entered the U S investing, uh, championship in June and I just, I was still working my job at the time, but I was sort of able to enter positions like, you know, with my computers at work. And I was just like, I was just trying to crawl my way up. Um, I don't know if you remember watching the company. It was pretty choppy in the summer, right? It was yeah, a really it was choppy that summer. It was a really choppy summer, just back and forth. And you could even see the rest of the competition. People were, people were up like 15, 20%. Like it, what it, it was like not a really good showing, and so I was just like, man, if I could just like crawl my way up, I could like you know maybe get in the top like fifteen or something, and so I um, I basically yeah I, I I started finding good little bases. They would break out. They would go for like two or three days, and I would take a profit, and then I would go to the next one and find you know a little base that you know just had really good action breaks out to new highs take it after you know a few days and my losses were minimal i was like i was getting out break even or i would buy a stock and it would go down a quarter of a percent and i would sell it and so my my losses were just tiny and tiny. My, my my gains were also tiny but they were proportional like proportionally to my to my losses i was like making progress and so yeah it was like it was like october or november and um i was like in the top three or, or top two or something like that or i think i might have even been like first at one at one point and i finished the year second and so that was that was a really um it was a really interesting thing for me to you know have had zero success in the learning period and to completely blow up my account and completely quit and to really just experience rock rock bottom 
And then to be able to, um, just in that summer, almost like, you know, understand what I was doing wrong and, and just sort of taking the slow route of, of, uh, you know, pushing my account higher. And the, yeah, that, that year it wasn't, it wasn't like a crazy super performance. Like, like the last couple of years, people have been making hundreds of percents. And yeah. I think I finished 2019 up 52%. Um, but that was good. That was good performance for six months, you know? And um, I think that really gave me the confidence to, to start getting back into it. And... Um, Can I ask a question, actually? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah, so uh, joining did, when you decided to join the U.S. Investing Championship, did you feel like that would kind of help you in terms of accountability or something like that? What, what kind of actually got you to, to enter? Yeah, it, it's... I, I think people do trade differently when people are watching. And, and I, yeah. I, I think I kind of realized that is that, you know, when I was trading on my own, I could do whatever I wanted to. And, um, and you know, no one, no one would know how much risk I'm taking, but when your name is up there and you're posting a gain or a loss every month, right. it's, it's embarrassing if you're up 30% and then you drop off the list. And, you know, like, you know, people are going to wonder what happened to this guy. Did he blow up his account? You know, did he take too much risk? So I, I did enter sort of thinking about that. And I do think the, um, I mean, th the competition is great for a number of reasons, that being one of them. Um, but yeah, it, it's just sort of a public way. It's, a, it's like a public accounting uh, or uh, accountability system, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, no, I... I I, I mean, I also entered because that was the competition my dad had won and I sort of wanted, you know, some level of redemption. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, obviously my dad's the greatest guy. We had, um, you know, he had forgiven me even before, um, even before I started making gains back. Uh, but it was just sort of a really good way to, to you know, uh, sort of show my dad that I, I was like trying to turn over a new leaf. And, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it was a good. Uh, yeah, that was a good year. And after 2019, I, I really thought like, you know, maybe I should maybe I should keep going and, and see if I could, you know, keep putting up gains. And I, and I have. So, um, uh, yeah, that was pretty much the start. And I could go into sort of maybe um, some of the things that I did that were wrong versus some of the things that I'm doing now that are working. What do you think were your biggest mistakes? Obviously, you mentioned, yeah. you know, trying day trading, taking too much risk. And, and then when you in 2019, you were a little bit a lot more strict with your risk management, it sounded like. But yeah, whatever you think yeah. really changed how you performed. Yeah. So 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 one of the things you can do, and my dad's a big advocate of this, is go go back and look at your mistakes. And I eventually did that in, in that spring of 2019. And um, it's interesting, I, you know, even when I was taking really big risks on stocks, um, I was I was making I was making a lot of money and I was also I was losing, you know, almost the same amount. And I had gone back through all my statements and I had realized that if I had just limited my losses to like a 5% or something like that, I would have, instead of losing 80% of my account, I would have been up, you know, 15, 20% for the year, which is crazy right. to think about, you know, that you could lose 80% of your account, but if you had just limited your losses to the downside, you would have actually finished up. And so that was, I mean, that was a really big aha moment for me. Um, and it, it sort of just, it speaks to the power of risk management. And, sure. um, so, I mean, that, th that's a, that's a big rule for me now. I, I take, it actually doesn't bother me. Um, if I take 10 losses in a row, I just make sure that they are minuscule and I sort of, um, my, I, I have a rule now, which is one, it's 1% of my portfolio. So I actually don't, um, I think in, in, in the O'Neill book, he talks about like a seven or 8% max stop rule. I mean, that's kind of like a relative thing because it, um, 
uh, position size it, matters. A, yeah. a seven or eight percent loss can actually be pretty big if you have your whole account in the position, you know. So right. it sort of depends on your position. But so I, I think about it in regards to your portfolio, and so my my limit is one percent for the account on every trade. That's like the most I'm willing to lose, and I've I've sort of found that um, I take ten percent gains pretty frequently, and so. You know the math. The math works out in that if I take nine losses in a row, I can still on that tenth on that tenth trade, if you know, make ten percent. I'll finish you know up break even or even you know close to a one percent gain. And so that's sort of that's sort of like a big rule I have is just one percent. Don't lose any more than that, and the rest will sort of sort of work itself out and I, I, I can't over um, I can't um, overemphasize yeah overemphasize yeah. how important that is just just right. um, and I think even Warren Buffett says this like like just the rule number one don't lose money right rule number two whatever listen to you refer to rule, rule number, number one, one. Yeah. just like try right. not to lose your principal and the only way you can do that um, is uh, I mean technically Technically, you can um, you can limit the downside by diversifying, or um, or having like a hard stop rule. The problem with you know having a hundred different stocks is that you're probably not going to pick a hundred different different winners. So right. um, you know those are the only two ways to limit the downside is diversification and and stop stop loss taking, and um, you you kind of need to be concentrated in order to make big gains. So. It stop loss it is you know um, but one percent is the is the big rule for me um, the the other thing I used to do is I would average uh, down and this is this is something I think beginning traders do all the time <clears throat> and you know they, they find a stock that they really like that they that they believe in right that that maybe even it, it has good earnings right um, and they they buy it and it goes down in price. Um, I don't know what it is, but you just feel this need to buy more because you're getting it at a discount now, at a lower. You're getting it at like it's cheaper. A it's cheaper. You're getting it at a bargain, and so um, that's something I used to do. But the w the way it works out is is those stocks typically just keep going down, um, mm -hmm. and so my losses would they would start to snowball. And so that's something I don't I don't do um, even a little bit. Uh, I used to be a pretty emotional trader in regards to like fear of missing out. So like a, a stock would break out of a nice cup and handle base, and it would be up like seven or eight percent. I would I would still buy up there. Um, I like um, because I wanted to get aboard the stock, and I wasn't. I thought, oh, if I didn't get this stock, then I, I wouldn't get a chance to get in, or you know, there won't be another opportunity for the next you know couple months. Something I've realized um, over the past few years in the competitions is that um, there are opportunities every single week in the market. If you miss yeah. a good breakout, it doesn't matter. There's going to be one next week, or there's going to there's probably something uh, that's going to break out tomorrow, and so um, it's not worth. It's not worth putting yourself in a dangerous position um, to to just get aboard this stock that that you want that that you want to um, be a part of. And then the other thing that I don't really do is um, is leverage. I don't actually um, I don't actually use a hundred. Sorry, I don't use more than 100% of my accounts. Um, in the past, I would use like 200% of my accounts and I would spread it out over like two or three stocks. Now, I I still take very concentrated positions. These are like 50%, sometimes 75% positions. And sometimes I'll use like leveraged ETFs. But even then, I'm only using my 100% of my account I'm typically not borrowing to trade stocks, um, and I think that's that's limited a little bit of the volatility for me. Um, but yeah, the the other thing, and 
I think this is a little controversial, but it, 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 it certainly helped me is that I, um, I don't actually, uh, focus on fundamentals. Um, mm-hmm. C- Canslim is a, is a really great system. Um, but it, it caters it, like it, in my opinion, to a certain type of investor, someone with a lot more money, with a long, a longer term horizon, someone that you know cares about earnings. And I think if you care about earnings, um, you kind of have to, uh, you kind of have to be able to hold a stock more than three months until that next earnings report. And so, because I'm, I'm looking for stocks that are making moves between two weeks and two months. I, it just, it's not something that's really important to me. I'm just trading off the chart. And I think, I think that's, I think it's really helped me because, um, I don't really get attached to stocks. I just see it as a, I just see it as a vehicle to move my account higher. Um, a lot of people, they, you know, they, they love their Tesla stock or they love their Nvidia stock and they just have to keep going back to it. It's like their child. But to me, it doesn't really, I don't really feel any sort of attachment to any sort of equity. I'm just looking for a specific setup and I'm going to try to trade that over and over and hopefully compound that throughout the year. Um, I think the, I think the other thing about earnings too, is that it limits, um, it limits your, uh, your universe kind of like the stock. It does. It like, like when you're screening for stocks, um, I remember, going through stocks on market smith and you know i would have certain earnings parameters like i only wanted to see stocks with an above 80 eps rating and you end up missing a lot of really good setups and like you know even like biotech companies that have no earnings yet they just have a story about this cancer that they're trying to cure you know like like sometimes sometimes those stocks have amazing setups and if you have earnings parameters, you're not even going to see that setup, and um, and yeah. I, so I mean, on the on the so I think you you miss a lot of good stocks um, when you focus on earnings, and I think you can also get too attached to stocks that you know might not even really be uh, you know the most important moves at the time. So um, I think those are those are three pretty main categories. And then I think, you know, as, as you focus just on the chart, it's really easy to sell a stock because you draw a line, it, you know, the, the stock breaks out of this, of, of a local area. If it retraces down to that area, you're out, just get rid of it, you know? But if you, if you start thinking like, oh yeah, but their, you know, their earnings call is in three days and I just know that they're going to come out with a good earnings report that might like, that might trick you into holding on longer through earnings and then you get crushed because it reversed and gapped down. And, and so I just like, I think that's protected me as a, as a smaller trader. Um, and I'm really just trying to follow the big money. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to think too much. Basically. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm looking for those big moves that rest and I'm trying to get in as, you know, some big hedge fund is accumulating and, um, you know, I'm just sort of going to ride along their coattails, basically, is kind of how I see it. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask, you know, over the past few years, has there been any other kind of key influences or, or books or resources yeah. that you, you've studied? Because um, obviously you started with more of the can slim traditional books, but now... As, you, as you've gone on your own, I was wondering, you know, anything else that you found really, really helpful? Yeah. So, I mean, I have, I, um, I want to reiterate that can slim is a great system. I just think it, it caters to a different type of trader and there is a degree of relativity when it comes to certain trade met- methodologies working for certain people and others working for others. And I think some people can just sort of, um, uh, relate to certain strategies or certain people more than others. Um, and I don't, I don't deny that fundamentals are what, you know, really move stocks. Um, but it's, you know, it's bigger money making the, doing that research and, and making those buying decisions when you're small, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter as much. But, um, in regards to other influences, I mean, my, so my, uh, 
uh, I read charts like my dad. Um, mm -hmm. I very much, my chart reading is, I, I got that from my dad. Um, but other influences, I, um, I, I think chapters 10 and 11 in uh, William O'Neill's book on just sort of uh, uh, profit taking and risk management, I think those are gold. I think those are really great chapters. So William O'Neill is, is an influence of mine. Um, uh, Jesse Livermore, his, his book on how to trade in stocks, it's like a tiny book. It's like the yeah. small, it's I've so got it somewhere right there. Yeah, yeah. That book is, I think the most important book any short term trader could, could ever read. It's so small and it packs so much good information. He 100% is an influence of mine. I think it's just pretty tragic how his life ended up, you know, he, he made fortunes and lost fortunes and, um, you know, ended up com committing suicide in the end. So, um, really great trader. I love, I love just his perspective on, on chart movement and psychology. Uh, Nicholas Darvis, um, yep. the, how I made 2 million in the stock market, really great stuff in the, uh, in the technical sort of aspect. Also his, his views on just sort of um, like being close to Wall Street or like listening to the news, I think I think that's so important. Like it, it's not really. Um, I think I trade the best when I'm not looking at the news, when I'm not watching CNBC, when I'm just sort of like I'm just looking at the chart and and using that as my basis for my entries and, and exits. Um, Mark Minervini is. Uh, great. You know, his books are really good. Um, the VCP pattern is, is, I think it's something I, I always knew was there, but he, he, he sort of put a label on it. And so now I, I, right. I identify it as a, a volatility contraction pattern. Um, and then I, I don't know if it was his second book, but he talked about the, um, there's a matrix of, uh, it's like you're the only thing that matters to make money is your win to loss ratio, uh, the amount that you win versus the amount you lose and the frequency. It's just, if you can, if you can like make sure all those three things agree, you can make money. You don't have to really worry about anything else. Um, and so that was, that was pretty profound to me, just sort of thinking about the win loss and how many times you could churn that over throughout a year for the, for compounding. Um, and then, the last influence, I wouldn't say he's an influence for trading, but um, I really like uh, Ray Dalio and his perspective on, uh, I mean, he's sort, of, he's sort of like a macro guy, runs um, whatever his hedge funds go, uh, Bridgewater? Or is, Bridgewater, yep. Bridgewater um, mm -hmm. Associates. And uh, yeah, biggest hedge fund in the world. And he... Yeah, his perspective on debt cycles and the economic machine, I really, I really think changed my my thinking on just sort of the the macro inflows and outflows of money. But um, though, yeah, those are those are all the the main influences right there. You've got some older guys who are dead now, and then you got my you got my dad and Mark and um, Ray Dalio. Uh, that's that's pretty much the group right there. Yeah, I mean, I think I can relate a lot to that. I think that's that's my the exact same foundation almost. And yeah, just to reiterate, um, I think Can Slim is such a good foundational system to learn because there's so much truth there. But everybody at the end of the day has to find the tweaks that suit their time frame and style. Yeah. And, and you are much more of a swing trader, so stuff isn't gonna. Some stuff is gonna matter more. Some stuff right. is gonna matter less. Some people are trying to turn over their portfolio. Keep get the next swing while someone will hold, you know, a true market leader for the longer move. And you just kind of have to pick and choose what, what makes sense to you. And it sounds like you're, you're much more two weeks to two months type of type of trader. Yeah. It, and actually, yeah, just to add to that, um, the, the perspective of, uh, William O'Neill is he, he, he was chasing the greatest winner of all time. I think that's even on the cover of his book. He's, he's trying to find the greatest winners of all time. Um, and that's actually not even my goal anymore. I don't even pretend to look for that. I'm looking for, um, like the greatest winner of the next, you know, uh, the next two months basically. And you know, if right. I can find the greatest winner of the next two months, I can take that profit 
and find the next greatest winner of the next two months and sort of compound that gain throughout the year. And that's how I've been able to, to make triple digits is I'm not sitting with this one stock that goes 100%, but I'm finding a stock that does 25, 30%, and I'm just sort of taking it and moving it on to the next 25 or 30% gain while keeping, while keeping my losses at 1%. So um, that's, that's just been sort of the secret for me um, is that I'm just, it's much more short term. Start with, you know, how did you trade last year overall? What was kind of your mindset during different periods? You know, the turn in the market, when you got aggressive, when you did really well, where you had a drawdown potentially if you had one. Uh, it'd be cool to get a high level view of, of kind of last year. Right. Okay. So, so last year, um, last year was actually, it's, it's funny to say because because I, I made so much money this, this last year, I, I think it was my best year, but it was a very hard year for me because I, um, I was on the wrong side of the market for about three months. But so, so this is, so this is the S and I had been shorting all through last year and I had made a good, good gain through there, but I was just not really, I was not convinced that I was not convinced that we were going to recover. And the reason I thought that was that you had this, this big drop, um, over, over the course of, uh, you know, eight or nine months and the recovery was just pretty weak. It was just like mm -hmm. the angle was not, it's not like it, it was like, you know, coming back up in the same amount of time. It was taking a long time and, um, it just didn't look very strong and you can you can see what i mean like around here this this just this sort of looks like a short and so i mean all the first few months i was i was pretty bearish i was actually trying to take some smp scalps um but i it was like around it was around here when I think people started talking about AI and how it was going to, you know, transform the economy. And, you know, it, I, I think the other thing about the, the market this year that was tough was that, um, it was very few, it was very few stocks that led the market. Um, you mm -hmm. know, the magnificent, the magnificent seven really, really took a hold on the market. And I think that they account for about 35% of, um, of the the movement of the of the S and P or the the Nasdaq, but anyways, it was around here um, in May when I really started to pick uh, to pick stocks again. And um, I mean, I, the 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 process should um, it, the process should be you you pick the process should be. Uh, look for stocks and if the stocks are setting up you buy them you don't even worry about the market but at the same time i do believe that when the market seems like it's getting exhausted that's the time you should you know um look for shorts and when this when when the market seems like it's about to um uh it when the market's at bottoms that's the best time to sort of look for for stocks as well so um it was around here in uh, July. I'll just I'll show the daily. Um, I was noticing a price divergence with um, the RSI, and this is something I look at a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I've, I've mentioned this on on some other interviews, but basically, when when the price is moving higher. And the RSI is either flat or um, or down. That's that's telling you that the 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 move is losing momentum. It's losing steam and strength. And you can see that right here. So I was still bullish all in here, but um, it was around June that I I started to sort of pare back on my on my stock picking and I started to kind of look a little more bearish and I did get a really good short on a real estate, a real estate ETF that I could, I could show you that later. But, um, you can see even just right here, um, let's see in June. 
sort of made this high right here. That's fine. But then it came back up to that same level, right? The same price level and the RSI was lower. So right. from this point, I was, I was sort of like looking for market shorts. I was looking for stocks to short. And eventually it had these, these three final moves up. It's one, you know, one, two, three moves up. And then it had this big break and a pretty weak recovery. And, um, I didn't actually short the market, but there was this real estate ETF that I shorted that I made a pretty big gain on. But so basically, and actually, let me just show you how this RSI works, um, even in regards to, you know, some stuff last year, you can see it here at the very top. Um, uh, you got you got a high and a higher high, but then look at the RSI down here, right? You got a high and then, a, and then a lower high. So every time you see that, you kind of just have to get suspicious about, you know, where the market's going to go. And I didn't see this on a weekly chart, but I actually could have used this um, for, for the for the bottom as well. You've got a low and a lower low, but then on the weekly RSI, you have a low and a higher low. It was actually strengthening in October of 22. And if you had seen this, then you could have started stock picking, you know, three or four months earlier than anyone else. And so I think, you know, this is a really powerful way just to keep you on the right side of the market. And it's, it's something that, you know, I look at, especially um, just in regards to periods when I'm, I'm going aggressive and periods when I'm, I'm paring back. If I'm seeing strength on the RSI, but weakness in, in the price, then I'm, I'm starting, you know, I, I start to look for stocks to buy. Um, if I'm seeing weakness in the RSI, but strength in the, in the price, then that just sort of, that sort of tells me that, you know, maybe the move's getting um, a little exhausted. If that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, no, for sure. And, um, and actually, wait, sorry, I've, let me keep, yeah, talking. go ahead, go ahead. Because yeah, sure. just to get us, uh, to, cause, you know, it, the market had a pretty, a pretty bad, I mean, this was a bad, um, few months correction. Yeah, yeah. This, I mean, this was a pretty bad correction and I was short in, I was short in one position almost this entire time. So, so this was the longest position I had this year. It was like, it was like a month and a half or, or two months. I held this thing. Um, but but even here, you, you can see, you know, a price divergence, you know, price is increasing, RSI decreasing. And so even in this last little dip that we've had in the first, you know, week of this year, that could have yet, you know, the RSI divergence, it, it could have gotten you out, um, you know, before this little dip. And now I guess, you know, um, I guess in regards to my, my thinking right now, I mean, now you've got almost like this, I don't know, sort of weird, like head and shoulders. I don't know if this is going to make it back up to highs or not, but, um, it just, it, it seems pretty weak right now, but that's just sort of how I, um, that's sort of how I saw the entire year. I was pretty bearish in this, in this area when it finally broke above this level, I was mm -hmm. bullish. I was buying a lot of stocks in here. And then here, I, I really, I, I got negative on the market, started taking some shorts. I actually missed this entire move up. I didn't really get anything in here and that was tough. But um, yeah, I just wasn't really finding many um, opportunities. It seemed like everything was moving up at this time. So it, it was hard to find relative strength in the market. Yeah. But, and. Uh, Throughout last year, did you have any kind of significant drawdowns or periods that you struggled a lot, or is it was pretty consistent, you know, throughout the year, um, you know, just just finding the next swing? Yeah, it was it was a pretty consistent year for me. Um, the The biggest drawdown I had was in a stock that that I was in, um, and I don't know I don't know if you want to. I mean, do you want me to pull up that that yeah, position right now? Yeah, bring it up. So yeah, sure. Um, and you can see it in context. So, so this was the market. Um, I was seeing this sort of, uh, I was seeing this sort of, you know, weak move up or sorry. Yeah. This, this move up in price, the weakness in the RSI. And, um, 
this is the this is the US real estate ETF and you can just sort of see where I was where I was looking at it it had this big move down in 2022 um, like this right actually it had one two three big moves down and then the recovery it just wasn't recovering and you know that's sort of telling me that it's still in a macro downtrend and I think in gen general um, uh, generally speaking, when you have sharp moves down and weak recoveries, it, it's pretty much anticipating another another sharp move down and a weaker recovery. And it's the same, you know, with stocks in an up uh, in an uptrend. You've got typically the way stocks move is that they have a big move up and then they sort of rest, um, sort of down at like a slow angle like that, and then they jump up again and they rest sort of at an angle. But so. This was, um, you know, it came down pretty hard and it was sort of coming in at this, it, you could call it almost like a macro wedge. And uh, so I, I sort of made up my mind that this is something that I wanted to short. And I was just trying to, I was just trying to get the entry right. And so it was building this sort of, uh, sort of shelf, yeah. yeah, sort of platform right here you can actually see it broke out um and uh it yeah so it it's got this little base which you know typically when you see a base you want to be buying but the but the macro look uh seemed like a short to me so i'm i'm looking for an entry on the on the sell side and then this happened which um i I think is extremely bearish and when you have a platform or, or some kind of base that breaks out to the upside and then reverses, that's telling me that the, the direction is changing. And then you can also see from the big volume, right, that that this is just sort of um, uh, just sort of changing direction. It also enveloped the trading of the last, you know, 10 or so days. So it made all time highs and then reversed. And so I actually got it. Um, I actually got it sort of right at this neck, but I wasn't. I wasn't trading this. I wasn't trading this ETF. I was trading the the leveraged version. And so this is this is it basically flipped upside down. And so you can see um, you can see I so IYR is the um, U.S. real estate ETF. This was the platform that it was supposed to break and and continue lower. It didn't do that. It reversed right here. And so I got it at this neck. And mm -hmm. the way I play something like this is my position size is dependent on the chart. I let the chart and, and the stock determine how much risk I'm going to take. And so um, what I mean by that is uh, if I'm buying right here, I basically... I basically figure out where I'm going to be uh, selling it. And so I, I bought I had bought this ETF at like 42.50 sort of, you know, as it broke uh, to the upside here. This is just a really mm -hmm. great undercut example. And I decided that I would sell if it came down um, to these uh, these body lows right here around 3%. And so that because my rule is, you know, I'm, I'm only looking to, to lose 1% of my account, the 3% loss means that I can take a 30% position. And so if that, does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So, so I enter right here with a 30% position, um, still only, only looking to lose 1% of my account. And, um, so that's how I started the position and I just held this thing because you know, I thought the uh, I thought the market. Uh, I, I mean, I saw the market selling off at this point, and this was after the week RSI, um, and I just sort of held it. And y you can even see. I mean, I just have to point this out. Um, at this low, I mean, I got it sort of at the bottom here, but um, <laughs> the RSI was weakening, right? You could see lower the the R. Sorry, the the price was going lower 
and the RSI was strengthening. Right. So, I mean, you even see it there on this entry that, you know, even though the price is weakening, the RSI is strengthening. That's just telling me that it's, it's, pos it's possibly changing direction. Um, but anyway, so my biggest drawdown, I mean, I kept holding this thing and holding this thing and um, I added to it here. And I actually, no, sorry, I added to it here. So... I had, you know, I had like a 30% position here and then I added like another 10% here. So I had a 40% position and then I added to it on this breakout. And so I had like a 50 or 60% position at this point and the thing kept going. And my biggest drawdown for the year, I mean, look at this thing. It was, it was a monster. My biggest drawdown was this. Oof, so, that's I, sharp. so, I mean, I had like you know, more than half of my account in this thing, and it dropped 17% um, over the course of a, a few days. And I was, I was, you know, I, I hadn't sold at the top. I was sort of, you know, I, I, I kept holding it here and I was kicking myself because <laughs> you can see that, um, you can see here, there was an RSI divergence telling me to sell. And I didn't sell. The price had moved higher, and the RSI was was weaker, and so I just didn't notice it. I was so excited about you know the this ETF collapsing and this thing going up big, and so I missed selling it up here, and I just I just kept holding it, and I was this I was about to sell it, and this day sort of redeemed me. Uh, this sort of undercut and rally, which is um, very good for the for the upside, in my opinion. And the reason I, I didn't sell it, it, it was still above this really good sort of, um, you know, platform that it, it, uh, it had built earlier. And so I, I got this move up with my, you know, with with my entire position. And then I ended up I ended up selling the whole thing on this day. And it's because if you look at, you know, the RSI here, big, big divergence with the price and yep. the, uh, the RSI was weakening, right? And you can also see um, it had sort of, you know, three clean moves up. That's one from the bottom, two, uh, and then sort of three moves, weakening RSI, big volume. That's the biggest volume it had traded up to that point. And so, I mean, those were all things that were telling me to get out. Um, but I mean, that was a, a really big gain for me, you know, um, in total, I mean, this thing was a 50 something percent gain and I had, you know, the majority of my account in it this entire time. So that's a, you know, that's a, that's a great example of something I held for a while and, um, you know, was able to get a good gain out of. Yeah, I've I've got a few questions, Sean. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first, first on on adding to your positions, uh, can you kind of talk through you know the process that you do to decide when you want to add you know more more capital to a trade that's working, uh, and also how, kind of how much you decide to to add to your account because it makes a lot of sense your your initial risk you don't want to risk more than one percent yeah. of your total portfolio but how do you decide you know how much to add on do you kind of treat it as a completely other position or yeah, yeah. what's kind of your well, thinking behind so that so i don't like i i have this opinion that um as a stock is advancing the higher it gets out of your first buy the riskier it is so right. i i'm not on you know on these on these two areas i added to i added to them because they had sufficient time going sideways they had a sufficient time resting before they shot up higher um so that's that you know that that dictated my um, my opinion to add, but it when I'm adding it has to be uh, significantly less money than what I initially started with. So you know if if I put in thirty percent of my account on the initial buy, I'm really gonna I'm really only gonna put in you know another another ten another ten or five percent. Uh, I might right. do, uh, I might add 10% on that first ad and then I might add another five on the second ad or something like that. But I'm typically not putting, I'm not putting like another 30% in after 
after that initial buy, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect sense. Also, and then um, also, just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just a general sort of um, this is just a general like market thing. Uh, have you heard people say that like you can never sell like the exact uh, the exact or you can never buy the exact bottom and sell the exact top? Yeah. Um, this is actually pretty. This was actually pretty close to doing that. But in general, I'm really looking for um, I'm really looking for this middle section, like. Um, I think I was, I was, I was way too early on this and it was just sort of this opportune reversal that I, that I picked up here. And I'll, I'll show you more examples where this is more typical, where I sort of get in after, after the first big move up and then I get it on this right. sort of like cup area. But typically mm -hmm. I don't stay in for three moves like this. I'm actually only getting this first middle section and then I'm running. So, um, yeah, I can show you more examples with that, but uh, yeah, I, when it comes to adding to positions, I, I, I think the, the farther it gets out of that first buy point, the riskier it gets. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got more questions, but we can definitely run through some other examples and just keep them in mind. Uh, cause I want to dive into kind of your, your typical sell rules. Cause you've talked about the RSI and that's perfect. But I was wondering if there's yeah. other rules that you go by, whether you draw, you know, a, a trend line going up the bottom side or use any moving averages in your decision. Uh, but feel free if you've got another example, uh, to go through it there. Yeah, but, I, think, um, yeah. I think those are the best, I think those are the best ways to sort of, um, uh, you know, sh like show, um, how I do things, but for sure, um, this was Palantir was one that I got really early. Um, but yeah, I, I can, I can show, you know, I can show you how I got in and got out, but this, um, let's see, I had noticed this one. Um, I had noticed this one after the earnings gap. Yeah. Yeah. I, like it was really just the chart that, that attracted me. It had this, you know, big sort of move down. It's, it's this depressed stock. And then, you know, somewhere down in here, it's, it starts to hold, right. It's just sort of going mm -hmm. sideways. And then it has this, like this, um, you know, shakeout where, you know, people who had been buying or holding in here finally gave up. They're no longer in this thing. And then right, you know, right after the shakeout, it's got this, you know, big spike of buying it. Um, it doesn't quite, doesn't quite double, but it, it has like, you know, a 60% move and the volume starts picking up. Right. And then it sort of, sort of comes back down, but then it comes back up on super high volume. And, uh, and then it holds, it sort of holds this price around, you know, nine or 10. Um, but so that's, that's sort of how I, um, that's sort of how I saw it. These, you know, these volume spikes, this sort of price level attracted me and I just sort of started, started watching it. And, um, before I enter a position, I usually just draw a line sort of across the top. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of my pivot point, you know, like if it, it if it can break above that, um, especially with volume like this and the price movement before, you're going to have a big, you're going to have a big reaction. And so, uh, let's see here, it had a really big move up and I actually got this really early, um, as well. I didn't wait till it, till it got up here. I actually bought this at the high of this last day. And mm -hmm. the reason I did is because it, if you can see these sort of three or four days, on, on a smaller like inner day chart, it was doing sort of like a reverse head shoulders. It kind of looked like, it kind of looked like this, this little section right yep. here, it kind of had this look. And so I was buying, you know, on this day, right as it was crossing this sort of area. And what's really great about this setup is that I now have a really tight stop. You know, my stop is now at the low of this previous day, which would be, which would almost be like, you know, I, I buy it here and you've got the low sort of like right in here, this sort of thing. Um, and so again, this one, I was able to enter at, you know, uh, like a 30% position, 25, 30% position. And it hadn't even broken out at that point, but this was, you know, a really big day. And then it just continued 
big volume. I mean, when I saw this, I, I knew, volume. I mean, th I was so excited when I saw this. This is like the, the best reaction you could you could hope for. Like t in two days, you're up 20% on that position. Um, but in regards to selling, I wait for reversal days. Um, and that mm -hmm. manifested itself here. This, yep. I mean, you can see it stands out like a sore thumb. Um, it, it opened at 15, it traded all the way up to 17, and then it reversed and finished it at, you know, absolute lows for the day. And if you look at the volume as well, um, the volume was, you know, some of the highest it ever traded. And I also just thought, you know, like, I mean, look at that, 53% gain in, it was like two, two weeks or something like that. And so at a certain point you have to decide, you know, what's your like risk to reward here, um, you know, to make 50% in a couple weeks off of, you know, a, a 30, 30 percent, uh, percent position, um, you can't really ask for better than that. And I think, you know, not to belabor, belabor the whole like RSI thing, but there was a slight RSI divergence here as well. You know, mm -hmm. RSI was sideways and the price increased. So that's just, it's just showing weakness. And, you know, I didn't get, I didn't get the all time high on that one. It actually continued without me, but, um, you know, like in these competitions or when you're trading, you can't really think about, oh, you know, what if I kept holding, uh, some, it's on to the next one, you know? Yeah. Sometimes that gain is good enough. You just gotta, you just gotta go to the next one. And so, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like when it comes to selling, uh, reversal days, big volume, um, you know, three moves up is, is something I look for and the, the RSI divergence. You can actually see three moves here on like in a macro sense. Um, look at this first move, second move, third move. I don't know. One, two, three. But um, yeah, I, I think I think something that's worth mentioning is just the uh, the time value of money and a lot of these sort of longer term moves, they they take a long time to, to develop. And if you're sitting in Palantir for two months, you know, that's a whole, that's a whole month and a half, or that's a whole month where, you know, you could be using that money somewhere else where it's not really, you know, it's not really growing as rapidly as the first move. So, uh, yeah, you've got the, our side divergence there with those two most recent tops too. Yeah, what sort of like these longer these longer term ones? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're seeing it too, like or yeah, like here, yeah. you know, like yep. it's uh it's everywhere. Like you, you can literally see it. Um I mean even in I mean even in Bitcoin, like like you know, it uh sort of got, you got this high, it, it keeps going higher but the RSI is weakening, right? You, you sort of see like the RSI is going down and then you have a big correction or, you know, the price is moving higher, the RSI is sideways and you, you know, so I think it's, it's something really important to watch. Um, yeah. And I, I had a question but, um, and you can, you can use it on your next trade or maybe on PL, PLTR. Yeah. Um, do you, do you move up your stop loss at all? Like oh. at what point do you protect oh. your break even? And, and yes. yeah. Um, you know what? L let me show you a, uh, let me show you a, like a loser or, or one that, one that I traded that didn't work out. <clears throat> same, you know, same setup. Yeah. You got this long term downtrend, um, sort of starts to go sideways. Right. And then it has this big price move and that, that really gets my attention. You see the volume. This is telling me, okay, yep. like this thing is getting accumulated by someone. And then it sort of regains that, that initial price it had. And so I start setting, you know, I, I draw a line across the top and I set alerts so I can track it. And then, so this thing starts trading pretty similar to like a, like a, a Palantir type thing. I buy this, um, I buy this one right as it's crossing this line. And I sort of have mm -hmm. like the stop around the high of this previous day. 
So 5%, mm -hmm. I had like a 20% position, right? Um, because, you know, once again, I'm only willing to lose 1% of my account. So 20% of my account is in this. I'm willing to, to lose 5% on the position that makes 1% in the account. Um, but so as this trades, uh, when, when, when it breaks out, I move my stop up to break even. That's sort of, that's sort of the goal right there. Um, so my stop is initially down here, right? 5% from, from the pivot. And then when it, when it breaks out, you know, maybe after the first day or the second day, I'll move the stop up to, you know, where I, I previously bought it because at that point it's a risk-free trade, you know, um, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the stock does. I don't lose money. And, and that's the most important thing to me. Um, now if it, if it sort of ha it, you know had this new price area and and went higher you know started like a second move up i would then move i would then move my stop to either the low of this base right or i would i would bring the stop up to the low of uh of the high right so i like you know i want to bank i want to bank some of my um my gains right but in this case, look at that. I mean, this was, uh, That's vicious. It, and this happens, this, this happens all the time, yep. which is why I, I mean, which is why you need to trade with a stop loss. But in this example, um, you know, because it, or it had already moved up, I, uh, I had brought my stop up to, to break even and it's, it sucks. I mean, I initially had like a 20 or 30% gain on, on this uh, position and I ended up getting out, you know, just sort of like break even there, but that's sort of how I would handle it. Um, an example here, I, I got to show you like a, another failed example where it actually sure. continued and I was able to get out with a few percent profit and you can, you can sort of tell like the shape of stocks that I like hopefully from these examples, but I like sort of a downtrend starts going sideways and then shoots up and does sort of like this like cup and handle base area. Yep. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, you can slam the, the, the methodology is you buy high and sell higher. And I do sort of have elements of that in that I'm, I'm buying these, like these local highs, right. But they're, they're not like all time highs, you know, if, I would have to wait until forty dollars to buy this stock um, at all-time highs, but so I'm I'm buying I, I'm buying this thing sort of in like a like a local high if you want to call it that. Um, but yeah, so it trades down, sort of starts going sideways. Look, it has it has like an undercut, shakes people out, and then has got like a big sort of you know buying move up, builds this little base, and right around here I was like, okay, this is this is a good little opportunity, it's sort of got the momentum, Just sort of draw a line, set an alert. I'm going to want to buy it when it comes out here. And I'm trying to remember, I think I did. Yeah, I bought it. I bought it here on this high and set my stop around $3. You know, this one was also like a 25, 30% position. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, but, uh, in just these examples, I guess they're all, they're all 30% uh, positions, <clears throat> but it starts going and you can see this is the, you know, first move up after the first move up, I, I moved the stop up to break even, but then it builds this tiny little base and moves up from there. In this example, I'm actually moving my stop up now to, to the, like the bottom of this base. Yep. Right, because it, it's it's established a new sort of uh, it's established a new pivot point. So mm -hmm. you know this was the first pivot point moved up from there. It's established a new pivot point right here. And actually, you know what? I think I added here. So initial buy thirty percent came up here. I added you know another ten percent or five percent here. But my stop is higher at this point. If that makes any sense. Um, and then look mm -hmm. at this. This thing just absolutely crushed me look at that I mean so 
Was that on earnings or was that out of the blue? You know, honestly, I don't even know. <laughs> I I don't know if it was. It was looking great. Yeah, yeah, I know. It was looking great. It, it kind of looked like this sort of yeah. turnaround situation. Um, I, you know, they might have. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know what the, uh, I don't really know what happened. But so you can see, I, I, I got sold out here, which was actually pretty high compared to where it went. Yeah. But I still, you know, I, I gave away my the gain that I had. But it's just like, you kind of have to do that to protect yourself. Any any questions on this one? No, I was just looking up. This is legal Zoom, right? So yeah, maybe yeah, there were some Chat GPT news out yeah. of blue, something like that. Yeah. And you can see, I mean, after a move like that, there's no point in staying in. Look at this thing. It just, you know, yeah. after after these things have these moves like that, they just go nowhere. Even even Weight Watchers, you know, after that drop, it goes up a little bit again, but then it just doesn't really go anywhere. So when you see when you see a, a move that big to the downside, you just sort of need to you need to leave it alone. Step aside, yeah. Yeah, step aside. And um find something else. Yeah, Sean on your on your buy side, um, yeah. are you typically executing, you know, at the open, at the close, or just kind of when it pushes through the pivot point that that you're watching? It's usually uh, just through the pivot point. Um, now, it's mm -hmm. it's really important where it ends the day. I think if it um, mm -hmm. if it uh, let's see if it closes or sorry if if I get bought in, it goes through the pivot point and then sort of squats and finishes the day low, like, like, let's say I'm, yeah. I'm like, I'm down on the position by the end of the day, I actually take it out of my account. So I, um, mm. I, I sell it on the close if I'm at a losing uh, position. And the re the reason, uh, the reason I do that is I, I think it's just there's a psychological value to it. I never want to sleep For sure. knowing that I am sitting with something that's that's losing me money. Um, I don't know if it's Livermore or someone, um, Darvis, but, uh, they said like the, the majority of money they made was when, um, they were right from, from the very, from the very start of a position. And, um, right. I totally agree with that. You know, if, if you buy a breakout and it reverses, um, it reverses right, right when you broke out, that actually, um, that's called a fake out. And, I mean, if I can sort of draw this, you know, you got like a cup and handle, you've got the neck right here, you buy on the breakout and that's all great. But if it reverses on a breakout, you like more often than not, it's actually changing direction and it's going to have a weak mm -hmm. recovery and then start a downtrend. Um, I think something, I don't know if this is like, um, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll share this. There are only really th uh, four, I think, safe times to buy a stock. And that's at a um, just sort of like a, a breakout, a breakout buy right here. Um, and then you can buy when something does a, a sort of a breakdown and reversal. That's a shakeout, right? So you can buy at the neck. Yep. I mean, this, this right here is so common and I, I, I actually, I'm starting to see these more than, I mean, maybe not breakouts, but the, you see this everywhere. And then, you know, the inverse, you've got the, uh, you've got the, uh, breakout reversal. That's sort of, that's like, that's what you call like a fake out. This is where you could short this and then, um, a breakdown is, is another short where it just keeps going lower. And so I almost exclusively trade these setups. And um, I think it it, it 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 keeps me out of trouble because there's a, a very specific buy point and a very specific sell point, right? You buy at the neck, here, I'll, I'll do this. You buy coming out of the neck and you hold it. Um, even, uh, wait, sorry. Even even here, you'd buy at the neck. You buy here, but then you would sell your position here if it crossed uh, down below it, right? And um, the same sort of here, if, if you're looking for a breakdown. Oh my gosh, 
let's see, you would you would short at the neck, right? And you would hold it. Um, but if it recovers, you know, you You're out. you you short right here. But if it recovers, you you get out. You get out. You know, you 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 cover your short. And so I think if people sort of st stick to those fundamental uh, plays, it, you know, it would save them a lot of um, a lot of hurt. Let's see. Do you want to see more examples or? Um... Yeah, let's do it. I've got some more questions, but yeah, let's yeah. run through some more. Actually, yeah, let me hear uh, more examples. Let me hear some some questions. I'll just I'll pull these up as well. Yeah. Well, first, you know, taking a step back, um, I think people are always uh, really interested in hearing about people's routines. So, yeah. you know, you, you, you've covered these trades, but um, I think it'd be nice to hear kind of the rationale and process to find these type of setups where you've got a longer term decline, you've got kind of the sideways neglect period, power move up, and then it's setting, setting up a base. Do you run screens? Do you just go through a lot of names? What's kind of your process for, for finding opportunities like PLTR, or Weight Watchers, yeah. or, or so, LegalZoom? Um, yeah, I, so what I do, which I don't really recommend people doing, um, but it's, it's really helped me, is that I don't necessarily run um, a specific screen, but I go through every single name in the, um, the, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. And I used to do it about twice a week, but now I do it about once a week. But I just go from, you know, from like by market cap and I just, I just, I just go through every single chart and I'm spending like half a second on each chart until something, you know, stands out to me. Um, yeah. And so I'm not running any screens on MarketSmith. Um, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I'm just sort of, I'm, I want to see everything in the market because you start to see themes popping up. You start to, you start to see that, you know, all of the, the gold miners have started doing well or all of the, you know, AI stocks are doing well. And you sort of start to see these things, uh, these things naturally produce. And these moves from the bottom, you know, with the volume and the price uh, color, they do stand out. So if I'm just sort of going, you know, you know, through the market and I'm hitting, you know, a hundred different charts in, you know, you know, every 10 minutes or something like that, um, you, you start to find names that, that sort of match the look that you're going, you're going for. And mm -hmm. I mean, I do that cause I just don't want to miss anything. I don't want to set a screen that's gonna, you know, take out, you know, these 500 stocks that I might want to, I might want to look at. And so, yeah, I just go, I just, I basically look at every chart in the market. Yeah. And uh, you've pointed out a few things that I think are worth reemphasizing about, you know, I, I think how you judge the quality of a setup, you're looking for, you know, those undercuts of the neglect period, you're looking right. for big volume ups, gap ups to a key kind of level that that coincides. Is there anything else that you really look for in the price and volume action that, you know, makes the setup like an A plus standout? I want to trade this uh, when it breaks out type type move. Um, let's see. I mean, volume is super important. Um, like, um, it sort of, it sort of validates that, that it's a re a real move. I, mm -hmm. I think, I think something that is also important is you want to see, um, notable price accumulation. If you, I mean, in this example, can you still see my screen? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, like you, you want to see a stock that that has the ability to go from two and a half dollars to six. You know that's a double. Mm -hmm. it, it went a hundred percent in that time period, and the the reason you want to see incredible price performance in the immediate term is that it it sort of di di uh, it dictates what it could possibly do in the next few weeks as well. You know, like mm -hmm. if it if it doesn't, you know, let's say the stock is up like you know twenty percent. The next move up, it's probably only going to be, you know, another 20% or maybe a 10%. Maybe it's like half of that. Um, but when I see a stock can move from $2 to 5 and then rest at that new price range, that's telling me that the next move, you know, it, it might not be a 100% move, but you're probably going to have like, you know, a 50% move or something like that. 
And so that's, mm -hmm. I, I think that's something that, um, you know, if, if people want to make, if people want to make big returns, they need to, they need to hop on stocks that are, that are making big returns. And so, um, yeah, you know, the, the downtrend, that's, that's fine. You know, it, you don't actually need a downtrend. I actually, I'm looking for a sideways action and something that just shoots up from that sideways, um, that sideways trading range, because I want to see that, you know, someone is gaining interest in the market, um, that someone is out there and they, they, you know, they found the stock and they're just, they're buying it every single day of the week. Um, and you know, even, even when it trades down, you know, there's, there's an institution that's going to keep it, you know, from, from falling and they're just pumping this thing up. You can see in this example, um, I don't even know how many days this was up in a row. I mean, this must have been up like, you know, 30 days out of 35 days or something like that. You know, that's not, that's not, that's not some retail trader that gained interest in the stock. That's an, inst, uh, an institution. And I'm really right. just trying to find the stocks that institutions are, are, uh, buying up. And I'm just sort of trying to ride that sort of, uh, the next wave essentially. So yeah, yeah that's big, great. Big volume, big price accumulation. It's got to hold that new price. Um, it's got to tighten up, you know, build like a nice little handle. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, besides that, you know, I don't, I don't really look at, I don't look for earnings or fundamentals. This is, this is enough to tell me, Hey, you know, someone has gotten interest in this company and I'm just going to, you know, participate in the move. So, yeah, you mentioned the theme though. Do you, do you like to trade stocks that you're seeing the whole theme shape up or it's really just on a stock by stock basis? Um, it's a stock by stock basis, but it certainly doesn't hurt if you see, you know, a group move. If an, if an industry starts to, starts to do well, then that, that's almost giving confirmation that the move is real. Just taking a step back last year, you've mentioned a few of them, but what were the kind of overall themes that you noticed and, and, you know, you know, groups of stocks that made that big, that made big moves? I mean, the theme this year, you can't deny it was AI. It was um, I mean, uh, Bitcoin started to move up. So some of the, some of the Bitcoin miners had pretty big moves and then you had the magnificent seven. So, you know, you, you had Apple and Microsoft, Nvidia, Tesla, you know, those had pretty, or, you know, Facebook and Amazon, they, those had pretty big moves, but I actually didn't, I didn't trade any of those. Um, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I, I think that's, you know, that's a key takeaway is that like, um, you don't necessarily need to get the it stock in order to have good performance right. in a year. You know, there's so many people screaming for Nvidia and, um, you know, Tesla or, you know, Bitcoin, but you can make, you can make money without, you know, without being part of those moves is, is kind of what I've found. And, um, I think, that's, yeah. I think that's a good reason to sort of like, you know, set FOMO aside. Like there are always opportunities. You don't need to get the the stock that everyone's talking about. Yeah, for sure. And um, did you want to actually run through the LFMD trade? Um, I, I think that looked like- Yeah, a, I mean that- Yeah. That was, yeah, so let's see. I was in this one, I, I, didn't, I didn't run this whole way. I actually got sold out here, but um, mm -hmm. you know, very, very similar play. Um, sort of breaking the neck here. I bought it. Um, so it, it on on the twenty eighth. It it opened, you know, around four seventy four. I bought this thing around uh, five dollars with a stop around uh, like a four percent stop. So this was like a twenty percent position. And really quick, you know, there's that reversal wick. You know, I had four or five or six days of good trading and, and I just decided to take it with the, with the 22% gain in, in six days. I, there, you can't ask for better than that. So it's not too bad. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously, you know, it, it kept going higher, but, uh, it, it does seem like with these, with these plays, the punchiest part is that first the first few weeks 
and then it just sort of like you know meanders and um yeah. I, I i've definitely found more value in capitalizing on the time element of trading and um yeah i can't remember who said it but it's like uh like like money money you can always win back but uh time time is gone you know time you can never get back and so when you're trading in these competitions for you know for 12 months you need to make most of every single month and um you know these first little jumps up that's sort of how you do it i think uh, yeah and over over the past few years as your account has grown do you, do you trade any differently or you're kind of still just doing the same thing? You've kind of figured out what works for you and, and just kind of focused on that. Yeah. I, I, I still have the same risk principle. So 1% mm -hmm. is kind of how I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, the account has grown substantially and, um, I don't think, I don't think I should do anything different is, is how I would, I would answer that. But um, there is a, a different psychology, you know, managing uh, a few hundred thousand dollars versus, um, you know, twenty thousand dollars. So um, it's definitely having a, a psychological impact, I think. Yeah. And um, there are a few questions about people on Twitter who um, asked why you like to focus on kind of the leveraged ETFs versus maybe, you know, individual names. I, I don't know if you have a good answer th for that, but, uh, are, do you just kind of treat those as useful vehicles for trading, you know, an overall theme that you see developing? Yeah. So the, um, yeah, I, I, I think they're extremely good vehicles for trading purposes. Um, especially last year when, when nothing was really working out, you know, everything was, um, everything was, was coming down and it was, it was sort of hard to find stocks that were working out. And so I was able to, yeah, with the, with the triple leveraged ETFs, I was sort of able to get these sort of, you know, troughs. And I, mm -hmm. I guess what I like about them just, and this is just like a, like a general concept. Have you ever heard that the market trades like, um, uh, like it, it takes the stairs up and the elevator down. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. So, yeah. um, yeah. So the, I'm typically shorting the, the general market with these, with these leveraged ETFs and, and I can, I can, you know, put up a lot of money to do that. And it's because I, I sort of get them at, at pretty opportune times when the RSI is weakening, I, I can sort of get the sort of rounding you know, top areas. And, um, you know, because typically the market recovers, you know, slower, uh, to the upside, um, you know, if I get sold out, I might lose like a percent or 2% here and there. But, you know, when, when they work out, I can, I can make like a five, 10% gain on the triple leveraged ETFs. So that's kind of why I use them is they, they just provide like, it just seems like there's a good risk to reward and you know because they're ETFs and they um, they're not individual stocks I think they're they're somewhat more immune to like a like a random market news or like like a like an earnings call um, you know gap down type of a thing and so or gap right. up and so I, I kind of see them as like just a good a good vehicle for like scalping on the market yeah, and um, and some of them might have more liquidity too than an individual stock. Oh, individual oh yeah. Is it, I, I yeah, think SQQQ yeah. is the most traded equity in in the market. I think more people trade that than anything else. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely it's definitely something that should be considered if you're if you're interested in going back and forth on the market. One thing that I know a lot of people are curious about is kind of uh, your statistics. You, you talked about how important that was, you know, reading Minervini's books. Uh, could you kind of cover, you know, over the last year, what's been your, your batting average, your average win, average loss? Because I, I think that can really put everything in perspective in terms of why it's so important to keep those losses small yeah. relative to the gains. Yeah, of course. Um, it's, it's really interesting, actually. Um, the there are two ways that I look at my my win to loss um, average, and it's by trades 
and uh, in positions and you actually kind of have to separate them because they're two different things and um, I'll just sort of give you the numbers but uh, this year I made 577 trades which is like hmm. it, it, it sounds kind of weird because that that's a lot of trades that's like almost two or three every single day of the year um, and my I, I my win rate was 0.37 which is actually only, um, it means I'm, uh, it means I'm right only 20%, 27% of the time. So yeah, out of, out of 10 trades that I make, um, on, only two, you know, two and a half, 2.7, almost three, uh, three are profitable. My, my average gain is 5.7%. And my average loss is 3.71%. And I think that's um, that's on the, the positions, not on the account, obviously. But what's interesting right. is that, so that's trades. You know, that's like, you know, all these individual little trades that I'm making throughout the year. Um, but I only traded 47 stocks in the year. And out of those 47 stocks, 21 of those were winning positions. And so you can see that I, on my trades, I'm only right 27% of the time, but on my stock selection, I'm actually right 45% of the time. And the way, um, the way you can kind of reconcile that is that I might take, you know, four or five round trip buys in a stock before I'm profitable on that, you know, fifth, right. fifth or sixth buy. And so... You know, when I see a stock setting up, I'll buy it. If it if it doesn't start going, I'll sell it for a small loss or a small gain. You know, like a three percent or five percent or less even. Um, you know, it starts going back up again. I'll I'll buy it. it. Starts coming down even a little bit. I'll sell it out. Get rid of it. And so I'll do that four times, and then finally it it'll break out, and I'll buy it again. And then that fourth you know, attempt is like the, the winning position. And, you know, I end up holding that for the 20 or 30% that it gives me. And so that's sort of, um, it, it just, it, it goes to show that if you control your losses, if you keep them minuscule, you won't get into trouble. And eventually, you know, that, that big gain will, um, will, overwrite all, all your losses but it's just crazy to think that out of you know 577 trades in a year i'm only right 27 percent of the time and i finished the year up 150 yeah. percent you know like i i was you know more wrong than i was right but i was still able to make a lot of money and i think that that's sort of like the big uh takeaway i think takeaway uh for people yeah and um, you might have shown them already, but do you have a sense of um, which trades had the biggest impact on your it, total performance? The, I don't um, know, if you know them offhand. The the biggest one was DRV. That was the the leveraged mm -hmm. uh, real estate trade, and then um, the second second biggest was Palantir. Um, there was a there was another one. Um, the the gold trade I made. I made some good money on uh, GitLab is another one I didn't mention, but that was my last trade of the year. And that was a good one. Um, but actually it, it is interesting. It like the, it only ends up coming down to four or five stocks. A handful. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, you might trade 40 stocks throughout the year, but it's really just going to be four or five that you, that really move your account. The rest are just sort of, you know, one or 2% gains that you get out break even on, or you lose like half a percent or a percent on, but it's going to be, it's going to be those four stocks that do really well. And if you think about it, you know, a 20, a 25% gain plus a 25% gain plus, you know, you really only have to do that three or four times and you've doubled your account. So if you can right. just get you know, three 25% gains, um, you're up 95% for the year. And so that's just sort of been, you know, my mentality is, you know, just, just find those few and you have enough months in the year to do that. You know, it, these moves happen all the time. So 
Yeah, it's just um, it's just keep your losses small and uh, and then just chart reading at that point. Yeah, and um, is there anything related to post analysis that you'd really encourage people watching this to to think about? I don't know if there's anything specific that you do when you're looking back on on all your trades for the year. Um, yeah, I, I I have started doing that. I I think it's it's just important to understand that. Uh, failure is a part of the uh, the the process. Yeah, it's a part of like success. Like like you um, you get your best ideas when you look at how you failed and how you should do things differently in the future. And um, yeah, I mean, even when you just think about the 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 process of making money, like I'm constantly taking losing trades throughout the year, and. Um, and that's just part of the process. You can't kick yourself when you've made eight trades in a row that are that are negative. Like you're, if you stick with you know what you're doing, you'll get that you know ninth and tenth stock that goes up. And so yeah, just sort of embrace failure, um, use it as a, like a, a learning tool, and also just like a way to to make money. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Sean, I, I really enjoyed this. I think diving into the charts too really, really showed your process. And it's it's a little bit different than uh, many of the traders I've had on before. So really appreciate your time and uh, for running through that. And again, just, uh, um, yeah, congratulations on your performance, not just last year, but over the past few years. So um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for coming on. And, and uh, it's, it's been great having yeah. you. Thank you so much for, for having me. And I uh, hope everybody watching enjoyed as well. Definitely leave a like down below, subscribe if you enjoyed. And uh, Sean, is there anywhere people can reach out to you if they want to get in contact or you're, you're, you're off the grid? Yeah, off the grid. I mean, um, maybe a Twitter someday in the future, but uh, not today. So we'll Yeah, see. cool. Well, uh, again, Sean, thank you. And uh, thanks so much uh, again for running through all of that. And to everybody watching, I uh, will see you guys in future videos. Take care.